And in 15 years, they went from 3,000 to 2,200. They lost 800 dealerships. 800 dealerships in, in 15, 16 years. Well, that's just how easy it is to manipulate data and look at it in a different way. I don't know the last time that I went to my Kubota or Deer dealer to have something serviced where they didn't have to order in parts. I mean, they all have to order in parts. Nine major manufacturers that are making these extra, extra brands that are out there too, all right? And so why is that? Why would you have multiple brands that are selling the same tractor. Wait till you hear Deer and Kubota though, because they do absolutely blow you out of the water, but I don't know where that's coming from. That's a big discrepancy there. You know, you're selling three a month if you're selling 36 a year, right? Compared to one and a half or one and a quarter or one and a third. I don't, neither one of those numbers excite me. Folks, there's been a lot of great conversation recently about what tractor brand you should buy good reasons all around it's a good discussion and it's got me looking deeper into the subject myself both just out of curiosity out of comments that have come about and just general industry knowledge right wanting to get more well just have a better idea of what it is that i'm selling right and so i'm on both sides of the equation i i buy tractors to own them and use them and, and put them in videos and sell tractor attachments. I also sell tractors, but I buy tractors to sell, right? So I'm all over the place. I have no current relationship with John Deere, with Kubota, with Coyote, with Summit, with any tractor brand that's out there. And at some point that will probably change. I would expect that to change. I am in the business and if you watch my channel at all, I like to grow and evolve and try new things and keep my business expanding. So expect that at some point. With who, when, I have no idea. But there's a few common themes that were out there being discussed in the videos and the comments and all that kind of thing. And I think just general curiosity uh, is, well, I, I think it, there's some questions such as, why would I support a new tractor brand? You know, how do I get parts and service? So anyway, I just started going through tractor manufacturer websites going through some of the news articles, the history of these different brands, and then finding what I thought were some big hitters, some, some key data points that I could find for most every tractor manufacturer that's out there. And I think it would be helpful for you guys to, to realize, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, just how old some of these companies are, how big they are, how many dealers they have, you know, what their, what their global footprint is, right? And so there's a lot of, well, we, we can, I haven't done much traveling outside the US, right? So I think a, a lot of us probably haven't, some of us have, and you maybe get wrapped into thinking the US is the world, right? But the world is a lot bigger place with exponentially more market possibilities out there too. And this will help put some of that in perspective along with some other just random data points that came up when I was doing this research that I think, well, it could be food for thought whether it's good or bad, but it'll help you make a more informed decision when you're going to buy your next tractor. All right, so nine major tractor manufacturers. Well, I should even say this data is what I came across, all right? This doesn't mean that this is all encompassing, doesn't mean that there's not any errors here. This just is what I came across, what I found, what I'm including. I tried to make it as all encompassing as possible, but there are certainly going to be errors at some point within this information but nine major manufacturers, Daydong, Mahindra, ITL, TYM, LS, Kubota, John Deere, Agco, and Yanmar. Now those nine manufacturers make 15 brands, Coyote, Bobcat, Mahindra, Solus, Summit, Branson, Bad Boy, Royal King, TYM, LS, New Holland, Kubota, John Deere, Massey, Yanmar. You know, it's hard to keep track of it all. I think even Case uh, might make some subcompact or compact tractors as well. But anyway, like I say, we're doing the main points here, all right? So there's a lot of options out there, but there's only nine major manufacturers that are making these extra, extra brands that are out there too, all right? And so why is that? Why would you have multiple brands that are selling the same tractor? Well, there's multiple reasons for that, in my opinion. And, and one is the case of ITL with Solus and with Summit, right? Now, Solus is going to be sold. They're, they're an international company, large, very large in Europe, and expanding into other countries. And in fact, 
They are actually in 135 countries as of 2021. 135, all right? So the U.S. is one of 135 countries, right? So that's a, that's just a small little segment. And that's one that they're just getting into and getting their feet wet, wet in now. But Solus is set up to sell through traditional, a traditional dealer network, while Summit, and I still love this about Summit, absolutely love it, how they are choosing to go a completely different route and sell through mass retail. And that's a whole other subject on how you get parts and service done, but it's accomplished very effectively by using an independent dealer network for service agents, right? And they have service agents that can come out to your house. You can take them into various locations to have that, that service done, but selling a tractor, anybody can do. And I don't mean to put this down to the good salesmen that are out there, but more and more with all the turnover that we've had, it's hard to find a good salesman. And so that's where videos and, and the internet in general has changed the game and why even I sell so many tractors sight unseen and ship them all around the country. It's just a different way to do it. And so Summit is capturing a completely different market segment by offering a different way to purchase a tractor, get it in front of a whole new set of eyeballs that's out there. And I think changing the game in a way that more folks and more, well, more manufacturers are going to start to offer and do that kind of thing in the future. It's, it's only, you may see resistance now, but give it 20 years and I think that's going to be commonplace. Now, but the other reason is something that happens in every industry all the time. And that's either going to be white labeling or private labeling where let's take Bobcat or Bad Boy or even Rural King, right? These are already dealers or stores that are established that are out there selling other equipment, selling other products, and they wanna bring this in. They're not starting from scratch and building out new locations for this product line in particular, but they wanna roll in tractors in along with everything else. And a great way to do that is to lower your risk by, by private labeling, white labeling, something like what Bobcat's doing with Coyote, right? They're, they're making the tractors for them, they're painting them a different color. I'm sure there's some tweaks here and there. But at the heart of it all, it's a Coyote tractor. And so there could be reasons why Coyote doesn't want to sell at a Bobcat dealership or, um, you know, with Bad Boy and, and TYM. You know, TYM doesn't want to have the tractors at Bad Boy or maybe Bad Boy doesn't want the TYM brand there. They want to keep everything streamlined and under one banner. So there could be a lot of different business type reasons for that, but it helps paint a picture of why that kind of thing happens. So the downside, I think, with, with that, with the private labeling or white labeling and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but I, I know some other, other areas that this goes on as well. But, well, if more hands are in the cookie jar, then there's fewer pieces for everybody, right? And so you either have to raise the price to get the same thing, or the parent manufacturer has to agree to make less money, perhaps on the hope that the increase in volume makes up for that, right? There's got to be an advantage for the, the parent manufacturer to do this. And... For the consumer, I think, well, if you're paying more to get the Bobcat version than the Coyote version, why? So maybe that comes down to the dealers right there and they can service it and, and have parts for it and everything else. But point being, this is just a case-by-case a -case scenario where I'd encourage you to think about all this information before you make a big decision. Folks, we are proud to be sponsored by RimGuard Solutions, a liquid ballast weight. It goes right inside your tires, completely hidden, we're big on safety on this channel. These tractors are just too light and tippy right out of the factory. Not only is it gonna help with safety, keeping those rear tires planted on the ground, it helps with loader efficiency and traction too. The benefits of RimGuard include being the heaviest all natural liquid ballast weight on the market. It's not gonna corrode your rims like the old calcium chloride. It's not gonna freeze and it's available at over a thousand dealers nationwide. Find the dealer near you at RimGuardSolutions.com. All right, so I don't have access. I have chosen not to pay for access to the uh, the big dealer data that you can pay for annually and, and get all the information that Tractor Mike puts out on a semi-annual or quarterly basis. I think those are great reports. And uh, Neil used in his recent video as well, which is also a, a good dissection of the data and a breakdown and good for, I think, consumers to see the size of the market in the compact world and get some scale and understanding of what that's all about. Now, using some of that information there, I'm not putting this, this isn't on Neil at all. This is on the information that's available there. Roughly two thirds of the market is owned by Deere and Kubota. That makes sense. You're always going to have the bigger fish and then a bunch of smaller ones that are trying to climb up the, 
the ladder and, and take a bigger piece of the pie and everybody's got to start out somewhere. So I'm going to try to use round numbers as much as I can to simplify this a bit. So 180,000 tractors is what's going to be sold, projected for the full year that we're in right now, 2023. Two thirds of that, roughly 120,000 of those tractors are Deer and Kubota. So that leaves 60,000 tractors left for the other 15 brands that are out there. So two brands sell 120,000, 13 brands sell 60,000, all right? So th there's some, that's some big changes, some big differences, right? So here's where I have a conflict with this information that the dealer data is reporting. They're listing 7,488, 7,500 dealers besides Deer and Kubota in the US, 7,500 dealers for those 13 other brands. Now, I went through and got a lot of information from manufacturer websites, from Coyote's website, from Mahindra's website, from Yanmar's website, from, um, who else? Oh, from TYM's website. So from a lot of these actual manufacturing websites that say how many dealerships they have in the US. Some of them, the smaller ones, like, like the ITL, right? With Solus and Summit, with Royal King. Solus is so new in the US, it's almost nothing. Summit is sold at Home Depot, Tractor Supply, Atwoods, places like that. I have no idea if those locations are even accounted for. They've really just been rolling out throughout this year and is, should be insignificant as far as it is in this amount. I don't have data on Bad Boy, Rural King, okay? There was some smaller ones, but the big hitters. Coyote has 450 dealers. Mahindra has 441. TYM has 320. LS has 350. Yanmar has 379. Couldn't find Massey, but a couple of random data points not on the manufacturer said 330 to 550, if we call it 450. I had to break up my calculator and those seven, okay, which are, I would say the seven biggest of the 13, 2,611. So unless, unless Solus and Summit, which have virtually nothing right now, unless Bobcat, which who knows? I don't know how many dealerships they're selling their, their Bobcat tractors at right now. Unless Massey, which the random information I found there said 335 to 550. So say it's 450. Let's just add 450 right in the middle. That gets us a little over 3,000. That's like half the amount of dealers compared to the 7,500 that, that the, uh, the dealer data suggests. And so I don't know where that's coming from. That's a big discrepancy there. And, and obviously, I don't know all of this information. I'm not privy to all of it. I don't pay for all of it, but I don't see how you go from 3,000-ish from to 7,500, which there in and of itself doubles the amount of tractors that are sold per dealer. And so the reason I mentioned that is because, you know, if you do the math, if there's 60,000 units between 13 brands or 60,000 units between 7,500 dealers, that's only eight tractors a year that are sold at a dealer location. But if you just slice that number in half because there's only, well, in this case, 3,750, if you slice it in half, that would immediately up it to, to 16 tractors a year, right? Or more than one a month, one and a quarter a month, or one and a third a month or something like that. So say it's 16, right? Or say it is actually more like that 3,500 number and you're starting to creep closer to 20 tractors a year. Well, I mean, now you're, you're doing almost two a month and that's just on average, right? You're going to have most of these dealerships are not selling one specific product, right? You're just like my dealership even, right? I sell used tractors by various brands. I sell all sorts of tractor attachments. We sell accessories. We do all sorts of stuff. And dealers are looking to make sales, not just on the machine, but then on all the attachments, right? Loaders, mowers, backhoes, the brush hogs, the tillers, third functions, rim guard, whatever else they're selling along with it. The service that comes down the road, the parts that come down the road, the merchandise, them coming back to trade it in and get a bigger one, them coming back to buy a second machine or maybe buy a lawnmower to go along or a UTV to go along with their tractor or you name it. So it's just one piece of the pie for these dealerships. And it's not that a dealership is relying solely on this one revenue stream, this one brand that's life or death for their company to survive. They're gonna have trained techs that are there to work on whatever brands of equipment that they sell. I would like to think that if they're not so overloaded, that they're probably gonna give you better service. And I think that it could be a double-edged sword to say that if you're not selling enough of the tractors, you're not gonna have enough of the parts available to support them. But 
I don't know the last time that I went to my Kubota or Deer dealer to have something serviced where they didn't have to order in parts. I mean, they all have to order in parts. And I think what the big key is, is having support and parts warehouses and parts distribution in the US so that you can have the parts within a day or two days, you know, via UPS or FedEx and then get to work on repairing it. That is maybe different than what it used to be, but that is more and more the way that it is now. And something that I am very, that's what I expect when I go into Kubota or Deer to have something repaired is that they're gonna have to order it and get it in. It's, that's after I wait three weeks or a month or two months to have it looked at. So there's a lot of different criteria that go into it and a lot of different ways that you can look at that too. And I would encourage you as well, talk to your dealer, right? Talk to, talk to them about their service department, talk to them about how it would be set up, what to expect. If I have something covered under warranty that breaks, how long? Am I gonna have to be in the back of the queue? Is it gonna be depending on what season it is? Do you guys stock this stuff? Where do you get your parts from? Answer those questions up front. That way you have a better idea and aren't surprised and disappointed down the road. Okay, so I wanna use the same information, which means it was what I found for the number of dealers for Kubota and what I found for the number of dealers from John Deere on their own websites too. So Kubota has 1,100. John Deere currently has, oh, what is it? 2,200, 2,190 dealers, all right? So that's 3,300 dealers there to sell 120,000 tractors, all right? And so if you do that math, that's 36 tractors. Okay, so again, I'm using my own math. I'm using my own data here to come up with, this, with these numbers. So a John Deere or a Kubota dealer, and again, I don't know how it breaks, breaks down between how many tractors Kubota sells and how many John Deere sells, but if we combine them together, those dealerships sell an average of 36 units per year per dealership, all right? And you compare that to 16, maybe 20, okay, on average for all these other brands combined. So there's no doubt that's how they're getting their bigger market share, right? I mean, they're selling more on average per dealership. But, I mean, 16 versus 36 isn't, that's not like, we're not talking huge numbers here, right? I mean, these are not large <laughs> quantities of machines that we're talking either way on, on a per dealership basis. You know, you're selling three a month if you're selling 36 a year, right? Compared to one and a half or one and a quarter or one and a third. I don't. Neither one of those numbers excite me. If you're, if I'm being perfectly honest, neither one of those are like, wow, you guys are really killing it. Going through the data, right? And just searching online, I found something interesting about John Deere. And I'm, this isn't positive or negative because I don't know, maybe it is positive, maybe it is negative, I'm not sure. But I was able to get a, a, a few data points in, in the history of John Deere, all right? And so in 1969, they had 3,700 dealers. In 1996, they were down to 3,400, so lost 300 dealers in almost three decades, no biggie. In 2007, you know, 16 years ago, they were down to 2,984. And now they're at 2,190. So they've dropped in 15, well, this might be 15 years, might be 16 years. They've dropped another 25% in the volume of dealers in the last 15 years. So they, long time ago, 3,700, now at 2,200. Right, so, and in 15 years, they went from 3,000 to 2,200. They lost 800 dealerships. 800 dealerships in, in 15, 16 years. So I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's good or bad. Maybe there were too many that were just flooded and too many in different towns and they consolidated because they only needed one. It's obviously a gigantic company. So you need to have a lot of dealer support out there for it, but, um, do with that information what you will. I think at the high level, it just shows you that in 15 years worth of time, a decade and a half, you can lose more than, that's the equivalent of two of these smaller dealers, right? This is like all the Mahindra and all the Coyote just disappearing out of the US just with the John Deere location. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I think that, hey buddy, oh, he's a jumping spider too. Got a little, he's got orange on him. No, he's, Kubota spider. he's a Kubota spider. He probably came free with a Kubota. <laughs> there you go. Let's break that web. All right. Anyway, um, so yeah, do with that information what you want. Like I say, I don't know if that's good or bad. I will say if you lost 800 dealerships, that's 800 dealerships worth of employees that no longer have a job there. Maybe some of them were able to get relocated to other locations. I have no idea.
but um, that's an interesting tidbit that I took away from that. So that's obviously a really easy thing for me to say, John Deere's going downhill, they're sinking fast, right? And I may use that as a clickbaity title, who knows? Because that's a really eye-catching number to be perfectly honest with you. But the truth is, I have no idea. That could be a really good thing for John Deere and for all their customers out there, or it could be a bad thing. I don't know. That's just how easy it is to manipulate data and look at it in a different way. So here's a different way that I wanted to look at these numbers. And we know 180,000 compact tractors are being sold. Now, that number is the 40 horsepower and less. So this tractor behind me is definitely not a compact tractor. You know, a John Deere 4066, as far as I know, is not less than 40 horsepower, so it should not be included. So we're talking just that smaller market segment. And I figure I'm gonna guess how much a landed cost is to a, a dealership for one of these tractors on average with John Deere and Kubota and everything else in that segment. So we're talking your one series, your two series, your three series tractors, maybe 15 grand. Chris, what do you think about that number? Does 15 grand seem? I would have gone a touch higher. Okay. Well, that was my goal. 17. So that's kind of what I was actually thinking higher teens. And I thought I'd, I'd give it 15 grand and try to be on the lower end, knowing two thirds of the market, two thirds of the tractors sold are going to be the more expensive John Deere and Kubota. And then you're going to have one third that's going to be the cheaper brands that are out there. So anyway, I hope $15,000 as a landed cost to dealers is a conservative number not counting all the other attachments and things that go along with it, right? But you do that and times 180,000, you're gonna have $2.7 billion for that market for 180,000 tractors this year. 2.7 billion is a pretty good number. I mean, there's a lot of other industries that have bigger numbers than that, there's no doubt, but that's a good chunk. And so for there to be 15 brands to try to get a piece of that pie, okay. And if two thirds of that is Deere and Kubota, then you're left with roughly a billion or so, just a, just a measly billion dollars left for the other 13 brands that are out there and fight over. So you can just, in a high level if you want, just divide that out, right? I actually forgot to do that, I was going to. But a billion dollars, it's just a simple number that I use all the time, right? Well, my, my calculator doesn't even go to a billion, it only goes to a hundred million. Turn my, turn my phone set. Look at that, you turn your phone sideways and you can do bigger numbers. I should have known that. That's it. I've never turned. It's the scientific no kidding. That's pretty cool. We're learning new things all the time around here. So a billion dollars divided by 13 dealers or brands, I should say. That's $77 million if it was all divided out evenly between 13 brands that are out there. I think that's a, that's a pretty good chunk to try to go after at a cost level. That's not what's being sold to you at, at the, at the um, retail level, okay? That's just what the cost is coming to them. You know, tack on another 15, 25% on top of that, tack on the loaders, the mowers, the backhoes, all the other attachments, the warranty plans, the finance markups, the service and the parts, and the merchandise, everything else that comes at it down the road. That's huge, that's well worth wanting to go after a piece of that pie and think about the size of companies that you guys work for. A lot of you work for smaller companies, right? And some of us work for Fortune 500s and Fortune 250s, but think about smaller companies and what they can do with $80 million in, in, in revenue that's coming in, right? And you can do a heck of a lot. You can, you can pay a lot of employees for every segment that you need to run that business. And Again, I mentioned that number because you guys can do what you want with it, but for me, that helps put the figure in a different scale. Instead of saying it's eight tractors a dealership that's being sold a year, which is or isn't true, at, at the higher end of that level, one way or another, however you're rolling it, if this number is right, you know, which is a guess, right? You tell me if you think $15,000 is way off. Times it by 10 grand, right? So take a third away from that. I'd say it's $57 million a year. That's still a big chunk of money. So I think numbers are funny. Depends how you're gonna look at it, but you can do a lot of different takeaways. You can make numbers work for you. You can, you can make them make your case to strengthen it or to weaken it or anything you want to. And on that note, the risk here 
the risk here with these smaller companies is that they're going to go away, that they're going to disappear because other companies have in the past, right? Montana has gone away, Farm Track, Cub Cadet, Branson. Well, the case of Branson, for example, they were bought by TYM. This was what I think. This is how I think things are going to go sort of like this in the future if they do consolidate a bit. Why? Well, I have no idea. I would always expect there to be a company to go under or dissolve or be bought out. That's how the world works. I do think that this is a great example of being a win-win for everybody because it helps build and strengthen TYM as a whole because they, they wrapped in Branson into their fold. Okay, they are still supporting Branson. They have no plans to, to strand all those customers. And so now all the TYM dealers that were out there, which were separate, different locations than Branson, now they are also going to support servicing Branson, right? And so this is a, a big win for the consumer because now they have that many more opportunities to have their tractor serviced or get parts for it and, and they're not stranded. They're not left out there in the cold, so to speak. There's a couple anomalies, right? You're gonna have that. Cub Cadet, as Neil talked about, yeah, that's, that's a crappy situation. And I tried searching for Kubota, or uh, sorry, Cub Cadet, tractor parts online and it's really hard to find. I mean, you can find a few random ones here and there, but there's nothing consolidated. Now I did the same thing though for some other brands that have gone out of business. I did it for Montana, I did it for Cabela's, I did it for FarmTrack. And there's one website in particular that had both um, for Montana tractors. If you just Google something like Montana tractor parts, farm track tractor parts, this website has all sorts of it. Uh, of parts available for these tractors there. They specifically list that they have been doing this for over 50 years and this is what they do and that this, this is what they're good at. And so it seems like there's a good, a viable source out there to get those parts. Maybe you guys have tried that and it hasn't panned out, I don't know. Cabela's Tractor Parts, LegacyTractors.com uh, uh, says they can get any tractor part that they need for the Cabela's tractors, which Cabela's was uh, made by TYM. So there may be some other options there to get uh, those parts to TYM as well. But it seems like a lot of these brands that are out there that are no longer there, there's still ways to get access to those parts and that you're not completely stranded. And in reality, I mean, these are, these are kind of few and far between, right? There's not a lot of these examples that are out there um, over the years, but it can certainly happen. It's a risk to definitely take into consideration. But the one other thing I found interesting when looking this stuff up is you just kind of stumble upon things, right? And so somehow going through the, the Google results, you come across a forum post that I'm trying to find parts for my Kubota B2150. That was the first example that came up. The parts have been discontinued. That's a tractor from the 80s and the 90s. And then I was like, huh, let me do a little digging on, on this. And then somehow stumbled upon a, a, a guy that mentioned a Kubota B8200 and then a Kubota L185. And these are all tractors from like the 80s, give or take, sometimes into the late 70s and into the early 90s, right around there. So maybe something changed in that time frame. but it seems like there are even Kubota models that you can't get parts for anymore or are very hard to get parts for. There's even, I know the loaders, for even tractors in the early 2000s that folks will buy like a Kubota BX2200 or something and they're not able to get a loader for it. You know, I, I get folks that email me from time to time wondering where they can get parts for Kubota tractors too. And so even in such a large company like Kubota, this kind of thing is still possible for it to happen. And so I, if you're gonna buy an older Kubota, it may be worth checking with your Kubota dealer, right? Or at least Googling online and see if there are still parts available for those models. Now, a couple more stats here on these companies to maybe give you a little bit more reassurance that they aren't just a new kid on the block. And this gets back to these companies being global. All right, these are global companies. So Daydong, founded in 1947, been in the US since 1993 for 30 years. Mahindra, founded in 1945, been in the US since 1994. ITL, founded in 1969. They just got to the US market 2022, it says. TYM, founded in 1951, got into the U.S. in 2004. LS, founded in 1977, got into the U.S. in 2009. Kubota. Now, um, the company Kubota, I guess, started in, in the 1890s or something like that, but as far as tractors go, founded in 1946, got into the U.S. in 1972. John Deere, 1837. I didn't see exactly when their first tractor was made, but John Deere's been in the States since, since the beginning. Massey, they had a long time ago, or a date from a long time ago too, 1847. 
a lot of information to parse through, but 1953, they merged with, with Ferguson, made Massey Ferguson, and have been going strong ever since. Yanmar, founded in 1912, got in the U.S. in 1979. You're seeing a lot of 19s here, right? 19s in the 90s, 80s, 70s, that kind of thing in the U.S. So these companies have been around, all of them, except for HCL, in the U.S. for 30, 40, 50 years or more, all right? Not just John Deere and Kubota, but these other companies too. And they've been founded years or decades before that as well. Now, another stat on on the amount of annual revenue they do. All right, and this, again, I'm finding this information online. I'm doing the best I can here, all right? So some of these numbers are, are impressive. Even on, even on the, even the small numbers, I should say, are impressive. Wait till you hear Deer and Kubota, though, because they do absolutely blow you out of the water. But I would say it's also worth realizing some of these manufacturers are very specific to really just tractors and even just compact tractors. Some of these companies are, um, have multiple brands under their envelope. They have construction equipment and, and UTVs and all sorts of other products as well. So there's gonna be different scales there that are gonna skew these numbers too, but it's just fun data to kind of realize. So uh, Daydong, which is Coyote, they did uh, 1.3 billion uh, projected for 2022 was the latest number that I could find. Mahindra, 15 billion in 2022. ITL, 660 million worldwide. In 2016, actually, that was, I couldn't find any new information on that. So that's seven years ago, they did 660 million. I would expect with growth, they're over a billion by now. TYM in, in the USA, okay, I couldn't find their worldwide information. So I believe this is just USA, 470 million in 2022. LS Mtron, all right, $835 million, 2021. Uh, Agco, big one. Okay, that has Massey, Fent, Voltra, Challenger. So a lot of brands underneath that envelope. 12.7 billion, gigantic company. They make a lot of equipment though. Uh, Yanmar, another very, very big company. 8.7 billion. Uh, I think this was in 2022. Kubota last year, $20 billion. All right. And then John Deere, 2022 revenue, $52 billion. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot so anyway i think that also helps paint a picture that you know i, I don't think you're going wrong buying a john deere or a kubota I, I i just bought this kubota m5 this is this is for me right here you're going to see this in future videos i also just bought a coyote to put in future videos right and i still am hanging on to my john deere 1025r point is there's a lot of options out there Okay, and there's a lot of reasons that I sell what I sell, and market share is part of it. I can't tell you what to do or what not to do, but I, I think that that's the, the incredible thing is that we can take information and then we can make it make sense to us. And that's what you need to justify at the end of the day is how you're comfortable making the decision with any purchase that you are making. And on this channel, it's primarily related to tractors. And so, hopefully this gives you some comfort or maybe it helps you rule out some brands, right? And, and it's just one piece of the pie, but having a little understanding, a little history that most of these brands out there are not new. They're not new to the block. They've been making tractors for a long, long, long time. And, and <laughs> these are all big companies, all really big companies doing this. And it's, uh, it's good to have options, I think. And so the competition is really something where those small players are what put pressure on the bigger players and they chip away at them, right? They, they chip away a little bit of market share, they can make them nervous, but you're getting more bang for the buck on your dollar going with one of these lesser known companies. Are you getting more reliability when you're paying top dollar for a Kubota or Deer? Are you getting more features? Are you getting more capability? Are you getting better service and support from those bigger dealers? Those are the questions that you need to answer. So anyway, we may do some more of these videos, deeper dives in the future on this stuff. It's, it was interesting. It was fun to look into it. And uh, it's not meant to make a right or a wrong on, on anything about this topic other than to educate and entertain. So on that note, if you're in the market for a tractor or an attachment, we would love to earn your business. Go to goodworkstractors.com to see what we have for sale. We ship nationwide. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to stop by. And until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon.